I'm Dr. Aaron Stair. Please just call me Aaron. And I'm the host of the Trial Site News podcast. Super excited to chat with you today. For our viewers and listeners, we have Dr. Sabine Hazen, who's here. She does lots of cool stuff. Um, so I'm just going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself, what you're working on, what you do. Uh, gastroenterologist by trade. I um, was, was uh, you know, I went into medicine to understand life and uh, life took me on a path of, under, of going into GI. Um, GI wasn't as fulfilling for me as I thought it would be because it didn't really answer questions of life and death. And so I went more into the research path and in and research, putting products to market for uh, pharmaceutical companies or trying to anyways, if the trial was good or the medication was good. When um, C. diff was the bacteria that I was always involved with um, for enrolling for clinical trials, when the trials didn't work, I would do fecal transplant. And when fecal transplant showed me a little bit more than improving than curing C. diff. And I say curing because 92 to 99% success on uh, curing C. diff and not seeing the patients back in your office is a cure in my opinion. So when C. diff was improved and cured with fecal transplant, uh, the process of taking stools from a healthy donor and putting it into an unhealthy. And when that started happening for you know, I started seeing changes in arthritis uh, in some patients. I started seeing uh, one of my patients with Alzheimer's had remembered his daughter's date of birth. And so when that happened, I went on the path of curiosity, asking the questions, well, well what is doing that, right? What, what microbes are playing the role of regaining the memory of a patient and what microbe are suppressing the memory, right? Because that's how I kind of look at it. And then little by little data from my colleagues, which I call the biome squad, um, you know, doctors that do clinical trials on the front line, um, started seeing things like, you know, chronic urinary tract infections improving, uh, um, psoriasis in one patient. I remember one of my doctors and then a doctor in China actually said to me, ulcerative colitis, he had some amazing success, or um, a patient with suicidal ideation, he transplanted stools of a healthy donor, and then the patient was happy again. So that curiosity in me uh, pushed me to try to understand the microbiome. And I started sending my stools to different labs, and I realized none of those labs were validated because the same stool I would get different results. In other words, a different fingerprint of the microbiome. And so that's when I, I joined up with Dr. Sidney Feingold, who wrote the book on anaerobic bacteria. And, you know, fell for the man as a genius that he was to write a book to educate us on the power of anaerobic uh, bacteria that create infections. And so um, he guided me onto opening this, this lab and hiring the right person. And I just, you know, I just jumped. I mean, and then jumping into this abyss of looking at the microbiome brought multiple geniuses that I'm so grateful to work with from Dr. Tom Barodi to Dr. Sheldon Jordan at UCLA to Sasha Bistritsky at UCLA, psychiatrist. And to Dr. Wise, who's a rheumatologist at USC. So all these doctors, and then also doctors that I, my colleagues, you know, Neil Stolman from San Francisco, uh, Paul Fierstadt from Yale, um, Colleen Kelly from Brown University, uh, Alex Kurutz from University of Minnesota. So it's all these geniuses that basically just kind of came with the same thirst for knowledge of wanting to know, right? We all go into medicine for asking, being detectives, right? We don't go into medicine because we want to, I mean, some of us anyways, I'm sure some of people have made a business out of it, but those of us that went into medicine for the quest for knowledge, this is, you know, the holy grail, right? This is looking into the abyss and finding a whole new world. And then understanding that those bugs is what really helps you fight an infection like COVID or those bugs help you fight uh, an autoimmune process that you've been having or depression or anxiety. 
and really fine tuning on which bugs are doing that. And that's really my goal. My goal is, and I, I remember speaking at a, a meeting where the head of uh, the National Institute of Standards, Scott Jackson, was at that meeting and they invited me to speak. And he said, you know, basically, we just need to create a dictionary. So I said to him, I said, well, why don't you create it? And he said, oh, no, no, the government does not have the ability to do that. So I said, okay, well, I guess I'm going to create it and give him credit for creating it. Uh, because really it was his idea to start, you know, a dictionary of bugs mm -hmm. and yeah. disease. And that's what I'm all about. Um, no, I think it's cool. I think I, I was going through some of your, your sites to just kind of like prep for this interview and it's, um, really cool. It's really fascinating. I mean, the microbiome, it's just like this whole other world and yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, the word pro progenobiome, am I saying that right? Yes. So can you explain what that means? And, um, that's like one. So, um, I always believe that the, the microbiome is linked to your genes. So in other words, you're born with genetic material, but you're also born with microbes that you inherit from family members, generations and generations down. And I say that because when I looked at my microbiome, the, I was one of the first patients, I, I was actually the first guinea pig. Um, I call myself a guinea pig because I am all scientists. We try things on us first before we give it, try it on patients. So I basically took a stool sample and analyzed the microbiome and realized there's microbes that are probably from my great great grandmother in my gut. And so, you know, because some of them are just not from this area, they're from Spain, North Africa. So, you know, so what happened is I, um, I started looking at that and I said, wow, so I inherit my genes from my parents, but I probably also inherit my microbes. So progenobiome is from your progeny to your, your, your genes, to your microbes, to your biome. And so that's why I named it progenobiome. But it's a, it's a mouthful. And, um, you know, I have to give credit to my brother because he was the one that created it in a way and kind of put it no, in I think it's great and and your explanation it's awesome I think it's 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 kind of cool to think to think about it that way too you know you're getting all these bacteria from generations past like that's cool ability with the with a stool specimen to look at bacteria but also genetics because we have in our stool a new kind of family tree so um the the word reflorization you're credited with coming up with that word, is that right? Yes, I was tired of fecal transplant and- uh, <laughs> It doesn't sound, this is marketing, right? Like, <laughs> fecal. You know, I, I was given this role essentially with, um, you know, I think God gave me this role of stirring up, you know, the microbiome in a way. And, and, he, and he knew that I was kind of a hurricane. And so when this came on, I felt like, you know what, how do we explain it to people? And really, you know, we have to re-transform our, our looking of stools, right? We have been taught, and rightfully so, because, you know, it's, it's almost the waste of humanity is a non, should not be touched, right, in a way, because that's why it's a waste. It goes back to the ground, right? So it is... It, it, is an, it is a gift to be able to analyze it, but also understanding that it should not be, you know, manipulated so much because we have to understand that it all goes back to the planet. And to me, you know, we come from dirt and we go back to dirt, right? The process of dying, and I say this, is microbes in the gut and the process of a body decomposing is really those microbes in the gut that decompose the, the body and put you back into the earth. So in essence, you're, you're coming from microbes that are like generations and generations from your family, but then those microbes take over and you go back to the earth. I think one of the most amazing study that I want to do and that I want to research is actually following the process of decomposition of the body and testing the microbes in the gut and then the microbes in the soil. And I'm hoping somebody's gonna like latch on and wanna support this, this research with me. Uh, but that's my, my interest, right? To understand what happens to these microbes 
once we die, do they come back to the earth and what happens to them? Because, you know, micro, look at a bacteria like C. diff, right? Which is in our guts. Um, you know, some people think it's because we colonized. I tend to believe that we were born with C. diff as a non-toxigenic C. diff. And when C. diff gets suppressed, when the clostridium families and the diversity gets the, you know, killed, C. diff starts secreting its toxin to kill the host. But C. diff was there to begin with. It was just a happy little bacteria wanting to do nothing until we gave it antibiotics, more bacteria, more antibiotics, because what are antibiotics? You know, they're, you know, fungus, they're microbes, right? And we gave it back into the gut to kill off the diversity, which then makes the bacteria. So uh, flourish and secrete a toxin. The, the main thing and the main lesson I learned from C. diff is that, you know, it's an old bug. It's 10 million years old. They found it, you know, that it, it, it's around for 10 million years old. So why would a 10 million year old bug all of a sudden want to kill us unless we trigger it to want to kill us, unless we disrupt it, right? So, and I like to think of the microbiome kind of, you know, this little universe, mini universe of when you kill diversity, the, the ones that are like left will kill the host because the whole point of the body is to stay in balance. So the microbes stay in balance. Once you disturb that balance, your bad microbes come up, your good microbes go down, viruses penetrate, and then you're susceptible to uh, disease, to infections, to autoimmune processes, etc. And really that's the path that I'm gonna be demonstrating. There's a lot to write. You know, we have about 25 papers in the process right now because we've discovered a lot. Um, I wanted to ask you, so, you know, the fecal transplant that, or refluorization, sorry. That's so flora to flora, yes. Okay, so that's, that's one way to alter somebody's microbiome. So, and, and also uh, my understanding is that you can do it through diet. Maybe no. there are other ways. So could yeah, could you touch on that? Like what would, can you alter it significantly enough in your opinion to reduce a disease process, make someone feel better? So certainly we've seen those patients who say, you know, I went vegan and then I'm so much better. Or I went on a carnivore diet and I'm so much better, you know, and it's, it's both sides, right? So they're both, you know, fighting. So you, you go, well, what is it, right? And nobody's really looked at, you know, well, what does diet do? Is vegan better than carnivore? Is uh, vegetarian better than vegan? So nobody has really looked at all that. Even cumin, for example, is cumin good? Is cumin good for Mediterranean people, but maybe not so good in the Indian population? Remember, we're all from different sides of the world. So therefore we are born to a family that was living in a certain part of the world that part of the world had their own mixtures of microbes, right? When you go to Mexico and you're eating in a restaurant and all of a sudden you come back home and you're sick, it's because you're not used to their microbiome, to their microbes, and therefore you come back here and it was too much for your system because you went up in the, you know, whatever microbe you, you got over there. But for that population, that population survives. I remember being in Venezuela one time and I ate at a restaurant in the middle of the, in the top of a mountain. And I got so sick coming back. And I realized that the people were washing the tomatoes in a pond where the ducks were pooping, right? So of course I got whatever came from the feces of the ducks, right? But for those people that live in that area, they're immune to that because that's what they were born with. That's what they were raised with. So to me, I think that's, that's the interesting thing. And I think we're not doing enough research on things like that. What does vitamin C do to the gut microbiome? We're coming out with that data. What does vitamin D, we're coming out with that data. Awesome. So I think, you know, there's a lot of, to be said about yes, the nutrients. I myself, you know, would not want to, just because the procedure is disgusting, I would not want to be playing with stools the rest of my life to help patients. I would like physicians to fine tune the bugs and readjust the bugs and therefore just transplant. And Dr. Alex Guru says it best. 
He says, it is the microbiome that we're transplanting, not feces. That's why it should not be called fecal transplant, but it should be called microbiota transplant or refluoralization because ultimately yeah. microbes were playing with. The, this made me think too of the hygiene hypothesis a little bit. Like yeah. you were like, you know, they talk about like kids who grew up in farm. I grew up um, in a, like a farming area and um, they talk, and my dad was a veterinarian. So I've always like kind of, yeah, I've been, ex <laughs> I've been exposed to so many different things. Um, but is that, do you believe, and I remember talking to some physician and I feel really badly because I can't remember his name right now, but there was this whole thing on the hygiene hypothesis and the microbiome. What, what are your thoughts on that? Probably Martin Blazer you talked to, the missing microbes, maybe from New York, NYU, maybe. Anyways, uh, what are my thoughts? Yes, absolutely. I just came back from speaking at a farm. I was at Polyface Farm. They believe in regenerative uh, my, uh, farming. And I was, surround, I was in a tent with 400 people that were not wearing masks, that don't even believe COVID exists because they're so strong in their immunity. They're all farmers. They're all, you know, in with the land, in with the group. And, you know, none of them, I talked to them. I'm like, what do you mean? You didn't catch COVID? COVID didn't come? They're like, no, what are you talking about? We didn't catch COVID. We they got hurt because of the businesses closing and that's what affected them more than anything. So, you know, so you learn from that, right? You learn that maybe we should go back to basics. Maybe we should let the kids play in the playground. You know, you saw the studies of kids in kindergarten that were playing in the, with the soil and planting and they had less ear infections than kids in a classroom. What did we do in you know, what are we doing more and more? We're sterilizing. Why? Because those who are in control have an obsessive compulsiveness that they think that cleanliness equates putting Clorox on your counter and cleaning off all the microbes. What they're doing is they're sterilizing their environment and therefore they're creating a dysbiosis in their gut because they're sterilizing their guts. Now you can live with a sterile gut hundred percent. But the problem is when that sterile gut goes to India, it no longer is in a sterile environment and you're getting predisposed to getting infections, viruses, etc. And so it's no surprise when you hear of people that die, that, you know, especially in the wealthy population, they live in this ultra clean environment. And then all of a sudden they go to India and they start walking barefoot and then parasites start coming in and viruses and, and bugs. And then you end up hearing, well, they're dead of a cancer or they're dead of, you know, uh, of Alzheimer's or something. Right. So because it's not it's not it's one thing leads to another. I always say action leads to a reaction. You start with something and then it gets to something else. Right. We started with C. diff, for example, and we gave antibiotics for that strep pneumonia that the person got. And it was fine, but we forgot to replenish the microbes that were killed. And that was the whole movement uh, from Dr. Quigley uh, of probiotics, right? The father of probiotics and GI. So I think this is important for us to understand, for us to know how to treat in the future, that it's not a one pill solution. It's not a one formula. It's really an art. It's multiple colors. And I think, you know, that was the beautiful thing with Dr. Barodi is he thinks like that. He treats Crohn's disease, not with one pill, two, three, four. When we started thinking of treating COVID, he said, it needs multiple things. And I came up and said, well, it also needs vitamins. We need to put vitamin C, D, and zinc in it. And so that was the purpose, right? The purpose was to bring all that. And, you know, I always say uh, you can ask a hundred people to paint a tree and they'll all paint it differently. Same thing with doctors, right? And that's okay, because that's what's beautiful. Asking questions, painting it differently. But you don't paint a tree with black and white color, uh, black and white. You paint it with multiple colors, multiple shades of colors. That's what medicine should be. To practice the art of medicine, you need to start thinking of different ways. And it's not only in the medicines, it's also in the meditation. It's also in the exercise into this, you know, psychology, you know, obviously if you've had an action where you lost a child, that's going to 
play an impact in your gut. And then that's going to start the chain reaction towards disease. But you have to understand what happened to begin with. So, you know, it's very delicate, the whole thing. And I think we have to realize that it's not here, take a pill and you're going to be better. It's not. I, I love what you said. I mean, I think that's a great description, like the art of medicine. Um, yes. Yeah. I, and it's, it is that it's a, it's a creative approach and it's, it's observing, being able to be aware, aware and seeing, and, and that's amazing. Um, you mentioned COVID and I figured let's just talk a little bit about that since that's what everybody's talking about, but you, I, you, you and your team, um, you identified if I'm, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, you identified COVID-19, the, um, the genetic sequence in stool samples. You, you guys were the, the first, maybe the only to do that. And I think you found there was like 30 mutations or it was something like that. So what, so yeah, it's maybe like talk a little bit about that. And then what does that mean? You know, what I was thinking like, what does that mean for transmission? Like, do we have a fecal oral route now possibility or not so much? Yeah. So we don't know. Right. But it certainly asks, it certainly brings up the questions of if I carry it in my stools and I go to a bathroom and somebody uses the bathroom after and it's airborne now because, you know, that's how viruses escape the fecal material. Can you transmit it? And is it enough of a transmitting? So we don't know. So that's question number one. Number two, um, why I wanted to look into COVID in the stools, because I realized early on that eventually everything ends up in the stools, right? My, my look and my work on the microbiome has shown me that every bug, you know, from um, strep pneumonia is in your gut, right? It should belong up here, but it's in your gut. So there's the genetic imprint in your gut of every bug that you've ever encountered for every you know, different areas of your body. And so to me, I felt, and also we knew that, that that was the first hint. We knew that the virus latched on ACE2 receptors, right? And so when I saw that, I said, where's the biggest organ that has ACE2 receptors? I mean, yes, the blood, but also the bowels. And so therefore it dawned on me and I obsessed about it. And I told my scientists, we all have our obsessions. And I told my scientist, I have to look at the gut. We have to look at the stools. And so he said, you're not going to find it. And finally, I, I, you know, we kept harping on it. And then he called me and he goes, you won't believe this, but in 100% of the patients that were positive from throat swab, we found it. But also we found it in one guy who was never tested and was actually an asymptomatic carrier. And he had a different virus than the other people right so that's how i knew this was a different strain that he had but he was asymptomatic but in retrospect when you ask the question he had been sick months prior never really knew that it was covid so here it is lingering in his gut now at the same thing a young girl who was 21 years old um i looked in her gut and she was the daughter of a pediatrician friend of mine who was my first patient during the covid time and I analyzed her stools and she was sick for 45 days. She had COVID in her stools for 45 days. And that was again, something that said to me, wait a minute, so obviously it's in the gut for longer than we think. Maybe that's why we're not getting rid of it, right? Maybe because we're not focusing on the gut. We're all doing these throat swabs. We're all doing these nasal swabs, but we're not looking at the gut. So that was one. Now, the problem with gut microbiome is that you don't know if the virus is live or dead because it's a fingerprint, right? But it is, but you have to look at it as relative abundance, right? So in other words, how much of that virus is in the gut, right? So if you find one copy of the virus, well, it's not really significant, right? Okay, well, probably dead virus that's coming out. But if you find 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 copies of this virus, it's basically like a microscope zoning in and seeing a parasite that you didn't even know existed, right? And so that's what we saw. So when we started seeing that we had the potential and the possibility to identify COVID in the stools, we decided to say, well, let me do clinical trials to see if 
COVID disappears after I give it medication. So the before and after is more important to me than why is it working? In other words, why is vitamin C working on COVID? Why is vitamin D potentially working on COVID? Why is, you know, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, hydrox, um, eloquiz, why are all these thought to be early treatment working on COVID? And is it in the gut and then does it disappear from the gut? And so that's essentially our research um, to look at the microbiome. The other thing that I realized is, and knowing this from C. diff, obviously, if you have a dysbiosis, an imbalance in the gut, you know, C. diff is going to secrete its toxin. And how do we fix that by giving it multiple microbes and, and microbiome transplant? But same thing with COVID. If COVID is occupying the whole bowel, it's all, it had to have killed a bunch of other microbes that were essential for, you know, metabolism or, or vitamin B, um, you know, absorption. So that's why to me, it was important to not only find the virus, but also look at what is the virus doing on the microbiome? What is it killing the microbiome? So we're fortunate because we had a big database before of stool samples and our lab is validated. So in other words, I test my stools today. I retest myself in a month, a year. In fact, I, I was again, the guinea pig on this because I tried different methods of treatment and I gave it to myself and I wanted to see what is it doing to my microbiome? And that was the discovery. The discovery was having a validated lab that you can reproduce the data and showing that at month one, month three, a year from now, the signature of your microbiome doesn't change. And so when the signature doesn't change, you can see the relative abundance of the microbes that are important changing up or down. And that was really my path. That's what I did. And, and from your website, you, you're still conducting trials with um, the microbiome and COVID. It looks like you're recruiting, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Like So as much as everybody thinks, oh, we're getting vaccinated and we're fine, we're not done. Yeah. We're not over. I wanted to ask you about, so you, okay, so the COVID-19 disaster plan. Yes. What, okay. <laughs> what, what do we need to do it? What, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. So the disaster plan. So what happens is I'm on Facebook with a lot of friends and actually people will say, oh my God, she's always on Facebook, but this is my communication with my colleagues. So I'm friends with a lot of doctors and so, and I'm on groups of a lot of doctors. So this is the place where we, we, when COVID hit, you know, we took on the role of, okay, we're back in internship, working on the floors of Jackson Memorial Hospital, for example, that's where I trained and taking care of HIV patients that are coming vomiting blood or, or uh, unconscious and we have to fix them. So how do you fix these people? You have to rely on your colleagues because they do something that you haven't done, right? I mean, that, that whole collegial approach is really what we did from the beginning. So what happened is I, I kind of sounded the alarm because I saw the virus change from China to Italy. It was a different genome. And right off the bat, I said, this virus is mutating fast and we need to be aware of this because the mutation is what's gonna you know, be a problem. And it's gonna be a problem, I think, for vaccination because you know, if it's mutating too fast, how do you control that? Do you keep vaccinating every three months? I don't know. So basically what happened is I, I sent the alarm on Facebook to all my friends and on Facebook. And I said, this thing is coming, we need to set it up. And then I took my writer in my office who I write my, my manuscript with, she's, uh, you know, we're a great team together. And I said, we need to write a, a disaster plan for the doctors because they're gonna need to know how to manage these patients and how to protect themselves. And so I wrote it and then I sent it to all my colleagues and then they were sending me emails. And then that was a great way to collaborate because in a way, you know, we went from like, you know, a thousand physicians to now 14 or 20,000 physicians that we are all connected. So that was, and, and that was the beginning. That was the disaster plan was the beginning with them. The second thing was creating that protocol with hydroxychloroquine, vitamin C, D, and zinc was there to protect them, right? So in other words, you're on the front line, you're worried about COVID, 
why don't you try this protocol and why don't I follow you? So we started recruiting on that. The problem is unfortunately research got tainted, it, not tainted, but it wasn't as easy to do. You know, it wasn't as easy to recruit because it went so political that I couldn't recruit. I, normally clinical trials like that, I would have finished in two months, literally. The fact that as soon as I posted on Facebook, I'm doing a clinical trial and then a hundred trolls go on it and start trashing me. You go, what's going on? Normally, you know, or even you put an ad on Facebook, it doesn't circulate or trolls go on there and start trashing the trial and, and criticizing and bullying. And to me, it was, I'm in research. I'm allowed to ask the questions, right? That's what research is all about. Science is all about asking the questions. Who is stopping me from asking the questions? If we stop ourselves from asking the questions, we are gonna stop innovation. And guess what? What happens if hydroxychloroquine was the solution? But because it went political, because it went you know, the route of a bad drug, all of a sudden a drug from 1920s, is a bad drug, a drug that has never caused any problem that half of Africa is on for malaria, all of a sudden is a big problem. Who does that? Who says that? Same with ivermectin. A drug we gave to babies for scabies is all of a sudden a problem for COVID dying patients. I mean, it was safe to give to babies for, for scabies but now it's not safe for people that are dying with oxygen saturations of 50%. So there's a problem there. And that's, that's, that's the shame about the, um, the whole um, research being. Well, I think, um, yeah. And I think to your point, like, I think uh, science is asking questions, right? Especially you're a researcher. That's what you do. You ask questions and then you come up with ways to answer them, which is through research and, and testing. And that's why we do clinical research. That's why scientists that are in a lab with their PhD that are doing the experiment come to doctors like me and my colleagues to do clinical trials at the clinical level because thousands and thousands of hypotheses come out through the FDA. Maybe 1% of those make it to the next level. So, you know, I would hope that we're not entering into a world where the money guides these drugs to get into the to the next level because that's a problem that's destruction of humanity in my opinion yeah i would agree with you actually i have a, another podcast i just had people on talking about the dominant biomedical research agenda and how much it's influenced by industry and profit and it's just it's it's really discouraging and i think ultimately it will actually dissuade curious smart people from pursuing careers because you want to be able to ask these questions, right? That's the fun of it and be able to um, explore. Right, right. Well, I mean, listen, the, the idea that uh, robots can replace a human being and a human touch to heal is, is not there, okay? I mean, the fact is you could put people on medications and you can try, but there needs to be that human touch, right? That human touch that gives you hope. I think a lot of times, you know, my husband's a cardiologist and both of us have had quite good karma in our practices. You know, I, not too many people have died on our shifts. And, and I think part of it is because we give hope to people. Part of healing is giving hope, right? When you have a, a child with autism that you're going to try to help them, it, it's to give them hope because if you don't give them hope, what is there? And that's our role. It's not to give a formula and say, okay, do A, B, C, D, because A, B, C, D may not work for that person. But what will work for that person is the hope, the, the changing the mindset that their kid's gonna be fine, to see the light, to focus on positive, so. I, no, I agree. I think that there's a magic to the human touch that you, you just can't replace. As much as we try, you're not gonna be able to replace that. And, um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy about that. <laughs> I mean, otherwise we're, we're just robots. I mean, yeah. That's really, well, that's like brave new world stuff, but that, that was, that, that was ultimately a depressing ending. I think, um, but we might, I, you know, it's so funny. Cause I, that was one of my posts on Facebook was brave new world. Is it better to live in a life of delusion 
than in a life of reality. Well, for those people that have been tormented and, and victimized and there's no changes, probably for those people, it's best to be in a delusion world. Uh, but for the people that are, you know, are trying to do their part to change the world, to improve the world, to help people, remember, the doctors on the front line and why did I step in to help them to begin with were without a mask. They risked their lives to save other lives. And I think we forget that, right? Um, when I sent my husband to the hospital as a cardiologist around COVID patients, he was bare. He didn't even have a mask. I didn't have a mask. My siblings didn't have masks. So we had to fabricate these cloths and these, we went to, to Michael's to, to figure out how to, you know, find a, a mask or protection. That wasn't our role. That wasn't our job. We should have had protection. And so the fact that we were left there and we took it upon ourselves to say, you know what, I'm risking my life to help another person. That's what it's all about. That's what humanity is all about to help those that are less fortunate, that are less able to speak, that, are, that have been traumatized, that have been victimized, that have not gone in the same privileged pathway as others. And so, you know, to me, that's, that's my path. That's what I stand for. That, that's amazing. And I think it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, if you're facing backlash or censorship, like just for trying to be a scientist, uh, yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Sad. sad and i hope and, and, people... it's, and it hurts because it's sort of like wait a minute i went into this i spent my own funds nobody sponsored my research nobody's paying for my stool sampling you know that cost 1500 per sample you know taking care of a patient with covid cost me just between holter monitor medications fedex and all that 3500 dollars per patient Nobody, you know, came to me and said, okay, do it. I just jumped in it. Now, if it comes out as a product and then we become a pharmaceutical company or whatever, great. But that was not the intent. The intent was, I want to see the research. I want to see the research for myself first, because I'm going to be the patient. And that's why I did all this. I did all of, I jumped in to create Progenobiome. Because I said to myself, wouldn't it be a shame if when I'm 90 years old, I have Alzheimer's and I had the treatment and I knew what bugs it was, but I didn't take on, at 50, I wasn't, I was scared to embark on looking at the abyss. I was scared to spend money. I was scared of being criticized, you know, all those things kind of said, you know, I need to do it. If I... And I do it for me first and my family. And then if I help the rest of the world, great. But I think it needs to, we need to be able to ask questions and we need to be ethical. We need to be fully transparent. When I put these protocols on clinicaltrials.gov, I could have put a, a chemical formula of hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, vitamin C, D, and zinc and made it a beautiful proprietary product. But that wasn't the point. The point was full transparency so that we can show other doctors around the world how to treat their patients. And that was my, my biggest gift in a way to put on clinicaltrials.gov my ideas of how to fix this. So there was the disaster plan to begin with first. And then the second one was how do I send the message of these drugs might be the solution so I posted it on April 2nd on clinicaltrials.gov, knowing that if I show all the doctors and all the scientists, they will treat all their patients. And that went viral without me doing anything about it. So, except I didn't realize that President Trump was going to talk about hydroxychloroquine. Right. But, and then it was, what happened after that? Was it just power? It was, it was like, awful. It, I, I couldn't recruit, period. It was done. Killed. I mean... We had the one side of the, the right side that was, you know, believing in, in it. But the problem is we're divided. And remember, it's like the microbiome. If you have a divided microbes, right? And they stand in without a balance, not in unity, not in balance, you're gonna have viruses penetrate. Same thing here. You have a world that's divided where we're here. We need to be here and we need to be together.
But instead, we're not seeing this. And that's what's a shame. This virus, I think to me, this virus was symbolic of unity, of bringing the planet together. And it failed to do that. Instead, we're more divided than ever. And that's a yeah. shame. It's really interesting too, just kind of like a, a person's political leanings. You know, you hear it's like a, they have a different interpretation of the of the pandemic versus somebody else, and that's really it's like it's it's like two at least two sets of facts out there, and that is two sets crazy. Of facts. It's crazy and to think about that. Yeah, it's two sets of facts, and I I stayed middle ground on my views in politics because I don't really think it's black and white again. You know, some politicians on the right side are great. Some politicians on the left side are great. You know, I stay middle ground. So I get both sides um, on my social media. But I look at my friends that are completely to the right or completely to the left. And their vision is only on the right or only on the left. And I think you saw that from that uh, documentary on social media. That's what they prey on, right? They prey on your hate they prey on your, um, your interest and then they guide you, you know? So I started changing the narrative in my social media to be all about gardening. And now I'm seeing beautiful plants and they're trying to sell me, you know, different trellises and different pots of plants. I'm like, perfect. That's exactly what I want. So that's, that's hilarious. Uh, I'm going to try that on my end. I'm like, I try to maintain middle ground too. It's, it's hard to, it's hard though. And you lose, you lose friends no matter what you do. They're like, you yeah. Resist, you have to resist that thing in you that could potentially create hate. You have to resist it because when you put it out there and you agree with someone like, oh, I hate this person. Then all of a sudden it's all, it brings you to that path. So you really right. have middle ground, loving everyone, being happy about everything. Yeah. And it's like one view can get you on like the, the crap list, so to speak. It's, yeah. it's like you're reduced to one thing. It's like that old joke. Like you, you go out and you, you sleep with one goat or something. Like it reminds me so much of that joke. Cause I'm like, oh, this person tweeted something at midnight and look, you know, they're done. Their career's over. It's like, it's a weird world. Um, you know, and it's never over, you know, good publicity, bad publicity. Yeah publicity so i think that's what they teach you in marketing 101 so it's yeah. not you just have to kind of develop that tough skin to say ah oh, i don't care i mean and 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 probably why am i in this world you know i've had so many hits in my life uh, as a woman gi solo practitioner so you know embarking on a world of microbes that to me it, you know it became okay well what else are they going to say about me fine, whatever. I don't care. I mean, it, and then when you start taking on that attitude, which is I'm here for a job, figuring out the microbiome and it's not going to save me from my death, right? I'm eventually going to die. So, you know, all of us, so I'm here for one job and one job only, which is cracking the code of the microbiome and that's it. And hopefully in cracking the code, it'll unify the world to want to come to my path to say, wait a minute, I want to understand that also, because we are so obsessed with the materialistic things and, and material that we forget. And yes, the material is great because it allows you to get to the next step, but we shouldn't forget that with that material, we have to do good and we have to change the world for better. That's, I, I would love, you know, my path is when I rest, on my on my last day on the planet i will say you know what i did good i did my job i i feel good about it and that's all somebody can like ask for because otherwise if there is an afterlife and you're and there is a remorse i'd be in remorse my whole life i don't want to do that uh we, i don't have we don't have a lot of time but i wanted to ask you about your book which yeah. I plan on reading. I don't know if I can even say that, like, let's talk. Shit. Maybe they'll bleep it out. I have no idea. Like what, if that's allowed, I mean, I say it all the time, but, um, <laughs> we all say it. and it, it's so funny because there's a book, which is, and I, I joke and I say, wait, the book, the art of not given, giving a blank. Yeah. yeah. Popular book. Yeah. And let's talk sh.t. We can't even advertise on Facebook because it's, a bad word 
And how many people say it? And it's healthy to say, it's healthy to curse every, I've, there were some studies on that. 100%. And, yeah. and I, I named it that for two reasons. I named it that because I wanted to make people smile because I think, you know, that makes people smile automatically. I knew I would be getting a lot of jokes about it and it's okay because I never really take myself too seriously. So it was fine. I was ready for that. And then the other thing is I wanted people to be I wanted to be transparent. I didn't want to sugarcoat it. I didn't want to call it the refloralization book. I didn't want to call it the microbiome book. I wanted to call it what it is and what we are finding and what we are doing as doctors and playing with to get to cures. This is, not, it's not easy. It's definitely not a pleasurable procedure we do. I mean, I have a lot of noxema on my mask when I do it. So, you know, we do it because we believe in it, right? So that's it. And you know what? Laughter is the best medicine in my opinion. And we have to be, you know, hopeful and, and laugh because without that, then we're just, what's the point? I, I agree. I, 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 I do a lot of laughter yoga and the founder once said, he's like, when you can't laugh, laugh. And I'm like, yes. that's it. That's it. Dr. Hazen, I want to thank you so much. This was um, enjoyable. Uh, I learned a lot and I look forward to sharing it with our viewers. There's a paper coming out soon on the microbiome and COVID-19 because we are publishing that data. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be, it's going to be a game changer. Well, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day out there in California. <laughs>